Thank you, Jennifer. I know, I'm like looking around and, and like all these masks, it's like, do I, yeah, I think I know so many here and it's just amazing, I'm just so happy to be here and let me look, anyway, and to all the people around the world who have tuned in and uh, just, uh, I look forward to that day, that great day, um, this is good, this is good, but I, it will be great when we are able to touch flesh to flesh and be together. So, um, yeah. Before we start, a special thank you to Michael Mua and Adam, who have set me up here for success. It's behind me. I don't want to be there. Okay. There we go. Nope. You're getting a preview. There we go. Okay. Ah, so thank you. So this, this evening, um, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are gathering in an area of the Dakota homeland that was unjustly by General Zebulon Pike uh, in 1805 on behalf of the U.S. government under President Thomas Jefferson. Since colonization, erosion of the soils in Minnesota has increased a hundredfold. May we recognize this soil trauma as part of the genocidal harm that Dakota scholar Dr. Chris Matanumpa names the great evil. As we gather, let us commit ourselves to the yearnings within our religious and spiritual traditions for repairing harm. May this be our common work together on the way to a great justice. Mm -hmm. So this is my title. Resoiling the New Jerusalem. And you see the little slash in there. This is so Catherine Keller-esque, okay? <laughs> Resoiling the New Jerusalem. Dream reading Revelation 22.2 and women's speculative fiction for futures that feed us. So I want to plant a few seeds at first, okay, that'll kind of guide us along the way. And it is there. Just got to trust. So from the poet Camille Dungy, soon I will make a space in my garden for something that will look by autumn like edible hope. And from Bell Hooks. Okay, we have to get the rhythm going. From Bell Hooks. Grant us, great spirits, another chance to reclaim and nurture earth. And from Wendell Berry. And we pray not for new earth or heaven, but to be quiet in heart and in eye clear. What we need is here. And a seed from Revelation. The leaves of the tree are for... No? Okay. You got it. You can do it. Yep. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Okay, let's get that. And from Robin Wall Kimmerer, a great longing is upon us to live again in a world made of gifts. And from Sally McFay, theology must also be an affair of the imagination. Part one of 12. <laughs> there were 12 fruits, right? On the tree of life, you know, one, or one 
round a month, so you know this is all related. So, but they're they're modest in length. Don't stress too much. But part one: <laughs> whose dreams, whose imaginations? In his book, The Christian Imagination, Yale University professor Dr. Willie James Jennings traces the theological origins of race to late medieval Christendom and global European colonization. Jennings examines the ways Christian theologians, colonizers, church and political leaders interpreted doctrines of creation and salvation, which became, quote, diseased and disfigured, end quote, in viewing human identities and place-based cultures, resulting in the dispossession and profound commodification of bodies and lands repossessed as private property. By racial, gender, and geographical hierarchies, the colonial imagination became, quote, detached from deep participation with earth, end quote, and reoriented toward preparing individual souls for church pardons, the only gateway to eternal life in heaven. These demarcations constituted a, quote, abiding mutilation of a Christian vision of creation and our own creatureliness, end quote. Christian identity took on a kind of free-floating imaginary, meaning, as Jennings describes, quote, freedom from the ground, the dirt, landscapes and animals, from life collaborating with the rhythms of God's other creatures, and from the possibility of imagining a joining to other peoples exactly in and through the joining of their lives on the ground, end quote. This loss, these wounds continue with us today, experienced diversely, contextually, and embodied into any futures we might dream. Yet, Jennings asks, how may theology play a crucial role in healing Christian imaginations? My intent this evening is to explore what Sally McFaig called a thought experiment, or what Catherine Keller calls theopoetics, both involving imagination as a reparative, regenerative art, one of the, quote, Arts of Living on a Damaged Planet, end quote, assembled by Anna Singh and her collaborators. My focus is modest, even small, like seeds, involving one biblical verse, Revelation 22.2, one doctrine, eschatology, and one theme, soil. But I hope, like plant roots and mycelium, we will be connected with vast, larger dreams, like Julian of Norwich, who saw in the hazelnut in her hand an encompassing cosmos. See, as Adrienne Marie Brown observes, we are already living others' dreams. Quote, we are living now inside the imagination of people who thought economic disparity and environmental destruction were acceptable costs for their power, end quote. So as we recognize the great acceleration of the Anthropocene, let us also recognize this epoch as a capitalocene as well, and a plantationocene both consumed by what Amitav Ghosh identifies as the, quote, predatory hubris of white colonial Thus, as we gather in memory of Susan Draper White and in honor of the Women's Studies Lecture established in her name, may this week's symposium theme of This Planet, Our Hope, spark counter-narratives toward healing imagination and envisioning alternative and just futures. In her early writing, Mary Daly called this constructive work speculative theology. And our sisters, siblings, allies, and mentors who gathered in Minneapolis in 1993 called it Reimagining. Re <laughs> My hope is that the explorations we share this evening continue bringing the feast 
for our own and future generations. Part two, sacred visage. During the last two years, I found a re-energized sense of belonging in my city, Minneapolis, specifically South Minneapolis, the Cooper neighborhood of Longfellow just off of Lake Street. With the murder of George Floyd and ensuing protests, Lake Street became an incendiary and disrupted locale in many ways. Yet communities along Lake Street responded with amazing care, support, and mutual accountability. When the pandemic brought so much to a standstill, I was in a privileged position, working from home, yet quarantining brought feelings of aloneness and separation. So when the West River Road closed down to cars and opened up to walkers, runners, bicyclists, and friendly dogs, I felt compelled to get out of the house and re-familiarize myself with what Belton Lane calls the great conversation, including the terrains, plants, creatures with whom I am also neighbor. When I started walking the Lake Street Bridge, the visage of the Mississippi River Gorge was captivating. I had been traveling the bridge in various transport modes at least twice a day for over 15 14 years, heading to work in St. Paul, and then home again. But walking the bridge revealed a whole new city, encouraged by Julie Naris and her book, Seeing the Sacred. I took up the spiritual practice of taking photos on my cell phone when I found myself experiencing a moment of gratitude. There's one particular visage looking toward the downtown Minneapolis skyline with the winding river bend and the trees branching on either side of the river. Across day and night and changing weather, this visage of the city, trees, and river invited a contemplation of urban place, memory, sorrow, and belonging. These three, city, trees, river. Gaston Bachelard might have called them poetic reveries. Edward Farley might have identified them as deep symbols. Or Carol Christ might have invoked them as mythical archetypes of the goddess. To me, spring, summer, winter, and fall, the visage offered a stunning horizon of hope. But it wasn't until I read Catherine Keller's recent book, Facing Apocalypse, that another ring of meaning became clear. I realized I was mesmerized, or perhaps lured by, what Keller untangles in her final chapter entitled Down to Earth. Here she dream reads, a cluster of images emerging finally, but not with finality, in the book of Revelation. The images include the New Jerusalem, River of Life, and the Tree of Life, with its leaves for the healing of the nations. Within this cluster, she uncovers the, quote, apocalyptic conviviality, end quote, of Revelation. In her words, city, tree, water. Wow, maybe Dr. Keller and I were vibing on the same bridge and didn't know it, huh? <laughs> but I think this is Keller's in illumination. The prophetic sign New Jerusalem is not a predetermined entity hidden out there for when God decides to host a reveal party to replace the existing city of Jerusalem. Talk about supersessionism. Instead, the prophetic metaphors of city, river, and tree illumine the beauty, the flourishing, the open possibilities eminent within the ecologies where humans dwell. So might we contemplate the new Minneapolis, St. Paul? In theological 
medical terms. I'm talking about eschatology, that strange doctrine my younger self laughed at and certainly felt uncomfortable considering. I was a liberal Christian, too cool for revelation. <laughs> the doctrine of eschatology from the Greek term eschatos means last, has been structured like a dream. Oh, no it hasn't. It's been structured. <sighs> Nancy, there it is. It's been st structured, <laughs> these last. It's been s classically structured as the study of last things, identified as death, the last judgment, end of days, and final destiny of the soul and world. This may be why one particular narrative has tenaciously held ground, apocalyptic eschatology. Now the word apocalypse means to unveil or to uncover. When Revelation was contentiously placed at the end of the New Testament canon, no wonder it became perceived, consciously or unconsciously, as definitive for the Christian imagination of future end times. Fortunately, Jürgen Moltmann, along with sprouting liberation theologians, invigorated a, quote, turn to eschatology, end quote, following World War II by reframing the doctrine as a theology of hope. For Moltmann, eschatology was not the epilogue of Christian faith or about a future other world but about the future of this world, the reality in which human beings live. As Moltmann explained, quote, hope sees in the resurrection of Christ, not the eternity of heaven, but the future of the very earth on which his cross stands, end quote. Part three, an edge leaps, ah, leaps out. I like that. An edge leaps out. <laughs> Catherine Keller, who studied with Maltmann, and will be here April 4th, right? Yep. Get that on your calendars now. This is the warm-up act, okay, everybody? <laughs> okay, if you get this, you're all good to go. So she studied with Maltmann. And she provides a further clarification in the word that the word eschatos can also be interpreted as edge in contrast to end. This nuance has sparked one of Keller's lifelong passions, reading the book of Revelation attentive to edges of meaning, giving rise to narratives of what she calls counter-apocalypse. Since from her perspective, Apocalypticism, whether religious or secular, can't be canceled from the history of effects. Attending to possible alternative readings potentially redirects its present energies. For Keller, we can read Revelation more as a dream, like an assemblage of images and metaphors, surprises and tensions even terrors. Not all dreams are happy dreams. This undertakes the possibility for alternative actions, for alternative futures based on alternative narratives. Keller explains, quote, to mind such metaphors is to recognize that John is not predicting future facts, but he may be revealing fatal patterns, end quote. Thus, narratives of counter-apocalypse disclose, open up, life-giving possibilities, too. When Keller Dream reads the figure of New Jerusalem showing up in Revelation 21, she notes that the movement is down to earth, bringing her to ask, does this signify a mysterious change of God's own place? Or more precisely, of the human understanding of 
God's place. Unveiling divine eminence, New Jerusalem discloses earthy possibilities beyond the collapse of beastly empires with their greedy omni-hungers. New Jerusalem but an edge of cosmopolitan possibility signified by clear, clean waters and a tree providing copious fruits and abundance not only for people but creatures as well. The play of images invites us to redirect our echolocation for holy presence. As Kepler writes, quote, we have never lived elsewhere anywhere. Perhaps a down to earth regenesis of our life together is what the new heaven and new earth was always about. But what about the leaves of the tree of life? The leaves not just for one nation or exceptional nations, but for the multiplicity of nations. In Revelation 22, 2, the image of leaves comes into focus as gifts for healing. But in what way? Some interpreters identify leaves with medicinal properties. Others suggest that the leaves spice up a meal. Keller's dream reading links Revelation with the Jewish apocalyptic te text of Enoch, where leaves offer a fragrance wafting into the bones of people for healthful longevity. To me, any of these interpretations cook up an edgy counter-apocalypse. Why? Just one. Why not all lovely meanings here? But I would like to explore one more. In my local littoral context of South Minneapolis, a tree's abundance would be rooted in healthy soil. But can we dream read tilth into the new Jerusalem? The prophet of Patmos imagines pure light, gates of sparkling gems, jasper walls, and transparent streets of gold. What I wish for in my kitchen and bathrooms, unsullied space. But if there's a plentitudinous tree, then there's got to be plentitudinous soil. Maybe I'm dream reading with a midrashic mind about the unsaid, but in my arboreal imagination, the leaves signify healing because over time they decay into humus, feeding the gazillions of diverse microorganisms, fungi, bacteria, and creatures whose lives and deaths comprise what Soul Fire Farm co-founder Leah Penniman calls dark earth, or documentary director Chelsea Wright calls living soil. In dream reading, the down-to-earth visions of as invited by Pope Francis, the inclusion of healthy soil provides another counter-narrative for constructing eco-eschatologies. But no matter what biblical texts we draw on, we better be thinking about soil. Over the course of 3.5 billion years, Earth's diverse soils have evolved, yet in the last 150 years, between a third to a half of the planet's topsoil has eroded. In August 2021, the IPCC reported that, quote, soil erosion from agricultural fields is estimated to be currently 10 to 20 times higher, if no tillage, to more than 100 times under conventional tillage, than the soil formation rate. That, by the way, is one inch of soil over 500 to 1,000 years. Unless new approaches are adopted, the global amount of arable land per person in 2050 will only be a quarter of the level in 1960. Our precarious context leads plant pathologist Joe Handelsman to claim, channeling Rachel Carson, that we face, quote, a silent crisis toward a world without soil, end quote. 
Thus, for futures that feed us and our siblings, as well as all kinds of creatures and generations of neighborly kin, especially those vulnerable in the sixth extinction, doesn't it seem just and faithful to reimagine the regeneration of the fertility, health, and well-being of Earth's soils? We are in need of what Camille Dungy calls edible hope, which resonates with the moldy theologian in me for what I am calling edible eschatologies. Could one lush and verdant verse make a world of difference? The prophets still speak. The leaves are for the healing of the nations. Part four, mother trees and the wisdom of reciprocity. When it comes to trees, soil, leaves, and human beings, we have in more recent years received a whole new understanding, a revelation, about their relations from scientists, novelists, poets, farmers, for this evening, though, I would like to briefly focus on two scientists who began their research with alternative sensibilities in their fields, then faced discouragement, even disparagement, but eventually have become leading experts. First, I will turn to Dr. Suzanne Simard, professor in the Department of Forest and Conservation Sciences, University of British Columbia, and leader of the Mother Tree Project. Then I will turn to Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer, member of the Citizen Potawatomi, ah, forgive me, member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation, and the State University of New York Distinguished Teaching Professor of Environmental Biology and founder and director of the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment. Dr. Samard, first. Growing up in a family who logged with horses, Dr. Suzanne Simard was first employed by the British Columbia Forest Service to develop plans for replanting clear-cut old-growth forests. But Simard's dirt was problematic for the long-term health of the forest. Successful replanting needed humus and multiple species, even diverse species. She writes in her memoir, Finding the Mother Tree, humus is the product, quote, humus is the product of plant decay. It's where the dead plants and bugs and voles are buried, nature's compost. Trees love to root in the humus because there they can access the bounty of nutrients, end quote. Samard's unconventional hunch was that Instead of competing with one another, trees collaborate. So she experimented with how diverse trees share carbon and nitrogen through their roots in symbiotic relations with mycorrhizal fungi. Her research culminated in an article describing the quote, wood wide web, end quote. <laughs> That's a tongue twister. Wood wide web. But isn't it an amazing image? It's brilliant. Which at first was dismissed, but eventually received as groundbreaking, so to speak. Simard's research showed that trees are perceptive. They communicate, warn, and share resources with one another, especially their own kin and those in need. Trees have intelligence. They are not inert, simple, linear, predictable, sticks in the ground. No. One of Samard's findings is that when the oldest trees, the mother trees, or elders, she also calls them, face their deaths, they send out even more seeds and bequeath their stores of energy to their kin. 
As she explains, quote, the mother tree flooded the mycorrhizal network with carbon energy. Facing an uncertain future, she was passing her life force strength to her offspring, helping them to prepare for changes ahead. Dying enabled the living, the aged fueled their young, end quote. Samard's research unveils the generative wisdom of tree elders enfleshed in complex ecologies. As she summarizes her hope, quote, the forest is wired for healing. And we can help if we follow her lead, end quote. Generative wisdom also underlies the culture and work of Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer. In her graduate studies, Kimmerer faced dismissive attitudes regarding her indigenous view of nature and culture. Her best-selling book, Braiding Sweetgrass, presents plants as our oldest teachers, in whom we live in symbiosis, what she calls the embrace between plants and humans. For example, Kimmerer describes her time living in the northeastern part of the U.S. as living within the embrace of the maple nation. While we could think about maples providing ecological services, we can also recognize that maples and humans create a, quote, culture of reciprocity, end quote, where maples share their gifts of turning sunlight, air, and water into sap, and over, quote, centuries, their falling leaves have built this soil now farmed for strawberries, apples, sweet corn, and hay, end quote. Kimmer invites settler folk to, quote, enter into the deep reciprocity deep reciprocity that renews the world and thus grow the circle of healing to include all creation. You can hear, for Kimmerer, the kindred of beings constitutes a vast gift culture within the, quote, moral covenant of reciprocity, end quote. Humans are to share in the gifting through our own giving and receiving what becomes disrespectful is taking and taking, hoarding without any gifting of ourselves, turning relationships into extraction and exploitation, reducing kin to objects. Thus, key to the gift economy is gratitude and being present, listening and respect, never taking it all, restoring and giving back so the mutual reciprocity can continue. For gift economies stand in stark to economies based on private accumulation and maximization of self-interest. When reflecting on service berries, asters and goldenrod, or the three sisters of corn, beans, and squash, Kimmerer believes we need to turn to plants for their to economies based competition is now causing us to face the danger of producing real scarcity and growing shortages of food and clean water, breathable air and fertile soil, end quote. Both Kimmerer and Samard challenge narratives of human exceptionalism, entitlement, and extractive economics. Both invite us to recognize intelligences and wisdom beyond our own and suggest that we have much to learn in emulating the wisdom of trees and other plants. In fact, both scientists want us to expand our epistemologies to consider trees as living, sentient beings like ourselves. As Kimmerer invites, quote, we will live in a different world when we recognize the personhood of trees who have their own rich cultural lives. And from Samard, quote, we begin by recognizing that trees and plants have agency. They are the Samard mutually embracing relations, a form of entangled embodiment and intercorporeality.
Part five, our blood and its meanings. At this point of imagining complex relations with arboreal elders, leaves, and soil, I would like to graft in philosopher Rosalind de Prose and her concept of what she calls corporeal generosity, end quote. For de Prose, generosity is a pre-reflective openness in persons to others that challenges our notions of self-possession and self-contained egos. Corporeal generosity is not a rational cost-benefit calculation, but an embodied, quote, being given, end quote, that establishes communal relations. As she explains, quote, I also find that my body my blood and its meanings is opened by and flows toward the other, and so is not yet finished. It is this generosity, the unfinishing of my self-possession, provoked by the gifts of others, that would open and transform cultural conventions to admit different modes of being." End quote. If we extend De Prose's fl blood flow to others in an ecological direction, we will want to reflect on to whom we are being given. Not just in one act, at one time, when we choose, or with a particular set of feelings we decide. We might ask, what might it mean to reimagine ourselves as being given? within an animate world, with plants, trees, creatures, and soil? How could corporeal generosity and regenerative reciprocity impact our theologies, rituals, and religious imaginations? What difference would being given make with the ways we live through land, planting, harvesting, feeding our communities and others? How might we bequeath our labor, love, and commitment, even our own deaths in regenerating life? And thinking about edible eschatologies, if we shift down to earth, why would we need to hoard our bodies with toxic chemicals in embalmed private spaces, rather than honor more earthen, humble, and green burial practices. In theology, we celebrate our imaginative genesis as earth beings from breath and dust. So can we entrust our bodies in our deaths to the regeneration of creation? In his book of delights, Ross Gay reflects on what he calls the duff between us, musing forth the joy of being given. He writes, quote, we might call it sorrow, but we might call it a union, one that once we notice it, once we bring it into the light, might become flower and food, might be joy. Perhaps the joy of corporeal generosity might offer us down-to-earth Lenten meditations coming up. Hmm. Fortunately, okay, part six, starting with the soil. Fortunately, throughout the world, people are already making regenerative changes, moving from the Anthropocene to works inherent in what David Corton calls a great turning, or Joanna Macy, a great transformation. While there are plenty of dystopian narratives, there is a great multitude of grassroots initiatives underway for what we claim I and Avi Lewis call the years of repair. And 
animated film, A Message from the Future. We can think globally of Wangari Matai's Green Belt Movement that claims when we plant trees, we plant peace and hope. We can look to Navdanya or Nine Seeds Movement. Soil, not oil. No, it sounds young climate activists at the COP26 conference like UK environmentalist Dominique Palmer, Ugandan activist Vanessa Nakate, and British Bangladeshi bird girl Maya Rose Craig. In Israel, Dr. Elaine Soloway at the Arava Institute is germinating ancient date palm seeds to regenerate desert soils. And of course, there's Project Drawdown, which has identified the top five practices of soil health. First, food waste reduction, plant-based diets, silvopasture, regenerative agriculture, and girls' education. But here in Minnesota, there are movements resoiling the land. The Land Stewardship Project Soil Health and Climate Campaign recently received over $5 million in grants to incentivize adoption of farming practices, including cover crops and no-till farming. The grants also include equity to be based on farmers' races, genders, and small farm sizes. But there's so much more, and I could talk about these organizations for a long time. I'm just going to list them right here, OK? Dream of Wild Health, the East Phillips Neighborhood Farm, Frogtown Farm, Grand Rising Farm, Hopeful Earth Keepers, Hmong American Farm Association, Makoche Ikotsupi, the Dakota Land Recovery, Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light, Twin Cities Ag Land Trust, White Earth Land Recovery Project, the Women's Environmental Institute, and Youth Farm, among many others. These organizations and communities reject free-floating identities for identities and futures deeply embedded in culture, land, race, and justice. I didn't write these things on the bridge. Everybody knows that. <laughs> I love seeing people sharing their wisdom and views. <laughs> On the bridge. Yeah. <laughs> Part seven. Turning to women's speculative fiction. Yet in the work of regenerating edible hope, imagination plays a crucial role. People in diverse movements imagine futures in which they not only survive, but flourish. In theology, we have seen how Keller narrates counter-apocalypse. But what about our movements in theology? Sally McFaig claims that imagination plays a constructive role as we widen our sources from beyond biblical texts to also include the sciences, as well as the arts and humanities. For constructing edible eschatologies, I would like to widen our horizon to include women's speculative fiction or SF, in a comparable way to philosopher of science Donna Haraway does with her stories of the children of compost. So we'll save that for another day. With the arts of imagination, we learn to notice worlds around us, listen for stories of perishings and possibilities beyond heroic headlines, and collaborate with other than human beings in Sympoiesis, which lit means literally making with or world building of speculative stories. Thus, women's speculative fiction is not a dalliance or escape or a diversion. Seeding and feeding imagination can be at the heart of intentional regeneration and theology. So let's briefly explore 
several speculative fiction writers and the theologians they have influenced. Look familiar? <laughs> Part 8, Octavia Butler and a handful of earth and sky. The first storyteller to consider is Octavia Butler. In November 2020, deep in the pandemic, Octavia Butler's speculative fiction, Parable of the Sower, became listed on the New York Times bestsellers paperback list 14 years after her death and 27 years after it was originally published. As a writer, Butler faced many lean years, but gradually, like the way of change she saw so clearly, her life and writing have become a model for people, especially with BIPOC identities. As the first science fiction author granted a MacArthur Fellowship and the first black woman to win Hugo and Nebula Awards, Butler and her, her stories now span genres, activism, media, and literature, even theology. In her book, Making a Way Out of No Way, Monica Coleman draws on Butler as a resource for her postmodern womanist theology of creative transformation. Coleman attests that, quote, Butler is interested in how people might retain their humanity in conditions of extreme chaos and change, end quote. As Butler's characters adapt change and evolve, so her stories provide, Coleman says, a blueprint for adjusting to uncertainty. With the pandemic, racial reckoning, and climate chaos, Butler's SF sparked Coleman to name her recent webinar series co-led with Afrofuturist writer Tanana Reeve Du, quote, Octavia tried to tell us, end of quote. Have a listen. While we may be familiar with Butler's parable, The Sower, her short stories are also instructive. One example is Blood Child, about a colony of humans trying to survive on an extrasolar planet inhabited by intelligent beings named the Talik. At first hunted, some of the humans adapt in a protective Talik community by becoming hope partners, or kin, in bearing fertilized to lick young. Butler commented after she wrote this that she wanted to write, quote, a love story between two very different beings, end quote, in which the humans face difficult adaptations but ensure their survival. While Blood Child takes place off-world, adaptation challenges our world. According to Linnell George, Butler wrote, read across disciplines. She paid attention and observed, observed how things change. She knew how to practice the arts of living on a damaged planet. This is why she consistently returned to the question she began asking at 12 years of age. Quote, how can we make ourselves a more survivable species, end quote. While Butler considered speculative fi fiction to be, quote, a handful of earth, a handful of sky, she wrote herself in as one of a handful of black writers envisioning futures in which people of color bring about change to survive. As her parable protagonist, Lauren Olamina chants, quote, all that you touch, you change. All that you change changes you. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. End quote. Part nine. Brooding speculative fiction. 
Octavia Butler's speculative fiction has already seeded change on planet Earth, sparking the imagination of a next generation of community organizers, poets, spiritual seekers, artists, and more. Adrian Marie Brown and Walida Imarisha call these folk Octavia's brood, giving rise to the title of their own handfuls of earth and sky. To bring about emergent change, Brown advises, quote, first we imagine. We are in an imagination battle, end quote. While strategy is important, so is what Imarisha stands as, quote, unshackling the imagination, for then liberation is limitless, end quote. Together, Brown and E. Marisha claim the right that Butler claimed, quote, the right to dream individually and collectively. This relative labor is what they call visionary fiction. Brown's contribution to Octavia's brood is entitled The River, set in her hometown of Detroit, where outside investors take economic advantage of the precarious time. Brown's lead character, an unnamed black woman, follows the river's currents, trees, plants, and weather with a growing awareness that something in the river is alive <laughs> and discontent. No spoilers here. Brown's recent story, Grievers, is also set in Detroit during a mysterious pandemic when people are faced with leaving or staying. Here, her main character, Dune, is observant, resourceful, adaptive, caring for kin and strangers. Dune and by attending abandoned gardens, ritualizing burials, a map like altar in her basement. In Brown's visionary, speculative fiction, hope doesn't avoid or dismiss death. Part 10, Le Guin and a world of forest. Adrienne Marie Brown also draws on the speculative fiction of Ursula Le Guin. In fact, Brown served as the Le Guin Feminist Science Fiction Fellow at the University of Oregon from 2015 to 2016. In her correspondence with Le Guin, Brown asked her, quote, how does imagination help our species survive? In response, Le Guin wrote back, quote, it is through imagination that we think intelligently about what we've done, are doing, and should be doing. After Le Guin died, Brown wrote a letter to her about how much she had shaped her, quote, when I wondered if imagination could be necessary for revolution and transformation, you said yes. You said our dreams and visions matter. They are the way we make oppression temporary." End quote. Le Guin's speculative fiction also impacted one of my mentors, Sally McFaig and her theology of metaphors and models of God. In McFaig's classes, I remember reading from Le Guin's collection, Dancing on the Edge of the World, as well as from Buffalo Gals and Other Animal Presences. Drawing on Le Guin's influence, McFaig set her goal. Quote, the kind of theology that seems essential to me in our time is one that works at the foundational level of imagination, where the images that form our concepts are grounded." End quote. Le Guin is usually known for her tale, The Left Hand of Darkness, or for her Earthsea series. Like Butler, who Le Guin met several times, Le Guin received Hugo and Nebula Awards, as well as was a finalist for the Pulitzer National Book Awards. But I would like to consider Le Guin's short story briefly. 
It's called The Word for World is Forest, originally written during the time of the war in Vietnam. Hmm. Now I'm just thinking, what kind of fiction is being written right now in our world in order that our lives might matter and oppression may be temporary. In the story, though, of the word for world is forest, a militarized company of loggers has colonized an entire, entirely forested planet in order to extract wood resources since Earth has been clear-cut and soil reduced to dust. The nonviolent people of Athshi, with their small green furried bodies and lucid dreaming, they're viewed by the colonizers as lazy and thus conscripted into labor. Le Guin describes the quote, living forest, end quote, where Athshians live in thatched homes nested intimately amongst the roots of trees, a humus based humanity. While grief and violence culminate in liberation, the costs are terrible for the Athshians, as well as for the colonizers, whose arrogant inability to recognize any intelligence, culture, and personhood other than their own. Story now, 50 years later, questions about extractive relations of wealth, power, and labor continue. We stay in our epistemological bubble, separate from the worlds of those whose lives continue to live, that we continue to live from, without reciprocity, without corporeal generosity. As several of Le Guin's own brood claim, the story conveys an undeniable truth for our time that the destiny of forest, soil, and intelligence, intelligences beyond the human are entangled with our own. Part 11. Fagues brood. Or maybe I'd say Reimagining a world of gifts. In this last section, or almost last section, I would like to spin up some science fiction of my own. I'm one of her brood. Just a handful of what may become a larger project, who knows. As an ecofeminist Christian theologian, I too would like to work the ground of imagination to construct an edible eschatology beyond the human tapping into themes linked together here, adaptation, reciprocity, corporeality, generosity, evolution, and gift economies. For now, the story is entitled, Arbor's Gift. When I first held the fruit in my hands, I thought for a moment I was touching the soft skin of a newborn baby. Miriam, I learned her name later, had given the fruit to me, making sounds and motions encouraging me to take and eat. My exhausted life was in her hands and in the bodies of these soft brown fruits. The foragers found me splayed on the ground up along the hill trail. I had dragged myself from my hiding place to a point where I could see through the trees overlooking the valley. In the distance, chanting and drumming, a ringing I saw was a circle of people welcoming a procession of individuals dressed in colorful flowing clothes. They were carrying a bier upon which lay what appeared to be a shrouded body covered with leaves and branches, perhaps from the trees in the orchard in which the people gathered. The fruit's fr flesh was succulent and sweet. 
over several days of recovery, I did eat quite a few, slowly at first, but then with abandon. Who would have thought that the first bite of this fruit would root me to the soil of my own eventual grounding? They carried me back on a similar beer. Miriam was so kind, insisting her sisters make room for me by their hearth just until I healed and found my way. As I came to learn, the people of this village share an agricultural commons where the fruit trees are most revered. The soil and branches are tended with such intention and care. The leaves are gathered for mulch along with other waste. Actually, nothing is ever wasted here. Generating soil fertility is our most revered craft. The leaves are considered gifts. In fact, first falling is one of our most important feast days. And oh, how we feast. Of course, fruit is a staple. At first, I thought the fruit were large figs, perhaps a cross with pomegranates. After several seasons, Miriam explained that the word for fruit meant gift of the elders. Each of the trees in the orchard had a personal name and was addressed with kindness and respect. As Miriam said, the elders embrace us with their generosity and we in turn embrace them as our kin. I remember the day I first realized what this meant to share in the embrace. I had woken up early, dressed quietly, and welcomed the day with my song. After a long, hot season, it was finally ripening day. The fruit was ready for harvest. With the sun on my face, I suddenly felt a throbbing pulse throughout my body. It didn't hurt, but in touching my side, I felt a small thickness or swelling. Miriam's grandmother rejoiced that I had finally been embraced by the elders. The seed would rest in my side as long as I lived. And in my dying days, the seed would wake up and begin to throb again. At the time of my death, my body would be washed, anointed, and wrapped in fresh cloth, then buried by the grandchildren in the orchard. There the final embrace would be received in the germination of the seed. Growing intimately into the fruit tree they would call after my name, Elder Arbor. Now as I write these words, I, I do confess to a certain amount of fear with the embrace. But I am also filled with gratitude. For so many years, through thin times and abundance, this valley has become my home. I have been nourished by the embrace of soil, trees, rain, and sun, leaves and fruit, and the hands and hearts of my beloveds. How could I be given to without in turn giving myself? It's short. Closing. How will we return the gift? In closing, we pause once again on the Lake Street Bridge. No. Well, we'll pause. Yeah, we're pausing on the bridge, but looking at the leaves. <laughs> Close up. <laughs> we're pausing again near the Lake Street Bridge, hoping to glimpse the new Minneapolis, the new St. Paul. We now know that annual average temperatures in the Twin Cities have increased by 3.2 degrees Fahrenheit between 1951 and 2012, faster than national and global rates. Good time for a new curriculum, degree program, and equal we are also aware that distribution modeling shows that of the trees in the Twin Cities region, 20 species have low adaptability scores. 
73 species have a medium score and 90, sorry, 49 species have a high adaptability score. Hmm. As Terry Tempest Williams has penned, we are eroding and evolving both at once. Yet across our state, people are adapting together to reimagine and live into regenerative futures. There are possibilities of edible hope before us. Even, sorry, as with Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer writes, quote, even a wounded world is feeding us. Even a wounded world holds us, giving us moments of wonder and joy. I choose joy over despair. Not because I have my head in the sand, but because joy is what the earth gives me daily. And I must return the gift. Thank you. About an hour. Thank <laughs> you.